Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network's webinar, Pancreatic Neuroendocrine Tumors. The webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes and includes a presentation followed by a Q&A session. A recording of this webinar will be available on pancan.org under the educational events page. Wage Hope represents the rallying cry for the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. It's their relentless call to action to never surrender in their pursuit to change pancreatic cancer patient outcomes. If you would like more information about the webinar about Wage Hope, please visit pancan.org. The Pancreatic Cancer Action Network would also like to take this opportunity to thank their webinar sponsor, Lilly Oncology. We will be fielding questions throughout the duration of the presentation today, and you may ask an online question at any time by simply entering your question into the Q&A panel and clicking the Send button. Please leave the Send to default as all panelists. We will try to get to as many questions as we can in the allotted time, but please note that we may not get to every question and will prioritize questions that are related to today's topic and are more general in nature. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Dr. Jennifer Chan is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and is a senior physician in the Division of Medical Oncology at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. She specializes in the treatment of gastrointestinal cancers and neuroendocrine malignancies. She currently serves as the clinical director of the program in neuroendocrine and carcinoid uh, tumors at Dana-Farber Brigham and Women's Cancer Center and has been involved in studies in the studies uh, investigating novel therapies for neuroendocrine tumors. Now I'd like to turn the call over to Dr. Chan. Thank you, Sean. Um, I'd like to thank everybody also for joining in today's webinar. During the course of my talk today, I'd like to provide an overview of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, including features of this diagnosis and treatment options for patients focusing primarily on those with advanced disease. You know, this has been an extremely exciting time to be involved in the field of neuroendocrine tumor research and patient care. The field really has been transformed from one which just even several years ago had limited treatment options to one now with an expanding number of effective approved agents and also ongoing clinical trials. And during the course of today's talk, I'd like to review the current uh, and evolving landscape of treatment for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, focusing on um, options for treatment, some unanswered questions about therapy, and also ongoing and future research studies. So this slide um, provides an outline of the objectives of today's talk, which are to review the diagnosis and the epidemiology of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors to review the principles of management of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and also to discuss future directions for treatment and research. I'd like to point out, uh, first of all, that pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are a very different disease from exocrine pancreatic cancers, which include the most common form of pancreatic cancer, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and also a more rare subtype of pancreatic cancer, pancreatic acinar carcinoma. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are uh, tumors that arise from the neuroendocrine cells in the islets of Langerhans. It's important to distinguish um, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors from pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Not only do they arise from different cells, but they also have a different prognosis. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor is a much more indolent and a less aggressive form of pancreas cancer compared with adenocarcinoma. You know, the median survival of advanced pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors is measured on the order of years, whereas for adenocarcinoma with advanced disease, it's measured often on the order of months. Also importantly, it's uh, um, important to recognize that there are different treatment options for patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that are distinct from the chemotherapy treatments that are used for adenocarcinoma. 
to focus more specifically on neuroendocrine tumors and what they are, neuroendocrine tumors are neoplasms that arise from cells that are part of the diffuse neuroendocrine system that are throughout the body. And these types of tumors can arise in multiple organs uh, in the body, including the pancreas. They, compared with other types of cancer, can often pursue a course that's much more indolent compared to um, other diseases that may start even in the same organ. And they also are characterized by their ability to secrete peptides that may result in characteristic symptoms related to the hormone hypersecretion. It's important also to recognize that um, symptoms of hormone secretion may not be present in all cases, and in fact, it actually is the minority of patients who have um, symptoms of hormone hypersecretion from a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Although neuroendocrine tumors have been perceived uh, of as being a relatively rare tumor, um, recent estimates demonstrate that the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors is increasing. And you can see that from this bottom red line that I'm highlighting, showing that over time the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors is increasing. And this is in contrast to other forms of cancer where the incidence um, seems to have reached a plateau and may even be decreasing. The early um, estimates of the incidence of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors in the 70s was one per 100,000, but more recently the estimates from 2004 uh, include a, an incidence of 5.25 per 100,000. This increased incidence that we're seeing is likely secondary to improvements and, and also changes that have been made in the classification and coding schemes. Also likely related to the widespread use of endoscopy for cancer screening that has enabled us to find small gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumors in the stomach and the rectum, for instance. The role of dietary habits other environmental factors and medications such as um, proton pump inhibitors is, is not well characterized. As you can see from the curve that I've highlighted in, in, that's uh, in black, um, the incidence of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that has been reported to the SEER cancer registries has also been increasing with time. The incidence of pancreas neuroendocrine tumors at the 2004 time point was 0 0.32 per 100,000. Higher incidences of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors have been seen in autopsy series, which suggests that some patients may harbor small asymptomatic uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Regarding the stage at the time of diagnosis, over half of patients uh, present with metastatic disease. Most pancreatic uh, cancers, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are sporadic, and they aren't necessarily connected to any particular cancer genetic syndromes. However, more rarely, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors can arise in the context of a genetic syndrome. One of them in particular is MEN1, which is caused by an inactivating mutation in the tumor suppressor gene MEN1. Patients with uh, MEN1 syndrome, in addition to having pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, also can have um, parathyroid adenomas causing hyperparathyroidism, pituitary adenomas, and also can have neuroendocrine tumors, otherwise known as carcinoid tumors of the lung and the thymus. TSC2 is another um, genetic syndrome that's caused by a mutation in the tumor suppressor genes TSC1 and TSC2. And because of these mutations and loss of function of these tumor suppressor genes, there's activation of a pathway that's called mTOR, which has been associated with uh, development of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, also subependymal giant cell astrocytomas, and tumors that are uh, angiomyolipomas. Other more rare um, genetic syndromes associated with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor include NF1, um, neurofibromatosis uh, type 1, which is also an autosomal dominant tumor susceptibility syndrome that's caused by inactivating uh, mutations in the tumor suppressor gene NF1. And loss of this um, uh, leads to the loss of the function of a protein that's called neurofibromin that also regulates TSC1 and 2 that I had mentioned to you before. 
This leads to activation of the M4 pathway and is associated with neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. Also reported are neuroendocrine tumors of the ampulla, the duodenum, also in the mediastinum. Finally, VHL1 is another cancer susceptibility syndrome that is caused by mutations in the VHL gene, which regulates hypoxia-induced uh, cell prolifer proliferation and angiogenesis. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and renal cell cancers have been seen with this syndrome. I'd like to also now focus on um, some of the uh, key features of neuroendocrine tumors that are important to consider for each patient due to the influence on, on both prognosis as well as our approach to management. And these factors include pathologic features of the tumor, including grade and differentiation, which I'll explain a bit more, the location of the primary tumor, and then finally, whether or not the tumor is a functional one or not, meaning whether or not a patient experiences any syndromes, any symptoms related to um, hormone hypersecretion. This next slide goes over the pathologic features of neuroendocrine tumors that are important to consider. Um, there are various schemes that exist for classifying neuroendocrine tumors according to the features including dif uh, differentiation and grade. So differentiation refers to how like or unlike the neuroendocrine tumor appears under the microscope compared to its normal neuroendocrine cell counterpart. Grade is a measure of proliferation where a pathologist will count the number of cells that are in the process of division or mitosis. There also are stains, a KI-67 stain that can highlight the cells that are proliferating. There are various schemes for classifying the grade of neuroendocrine tumors based on the site of origin. But it's also important to recognize that all of these schemes reflect the observation that there's a um, a range of uh, behavior of neuroendocrine tumors from well-differentiated, low-grade ones, which behave in an indolent fashion, and that's in contrast to the high-grade, poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, which have a much more aggressive course. In general, these poorly differentiated, high-grade neuroendocrine uh, cancers um, respond to treatment that uh, includes a cytotoxic chemotherapy, and one classic paradigm for treating this um, form of uh, high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma is to consider treatment with platinum-based chemotherapy like we do for other high-grade neuroendocrine cancers in the body, like small cell lung cancer. Most of the talk today is going to focus on this um, uh, lower-grade, intermediate-grade, well-differentiated neuroendocrine uh, tumor subgroup. This um, set of curves is, is shown here to highlight the importance of grade and its correlation with prognosis. And this is data taken from a, a single center that pooled their data of patients with metastatic pancreatic and also intestinal neuroendocrine tumors. And they correlated grade of the tumor, the proliferative indices of mitotic count and KI-67 with outcome. And as you can see from these curves that are in red, which highlight the high-grade tumors, high-grade disease has a much worse prognosis compared with low-grade disease, which is in blue, and intermediate-grade disease. The second uh, feature that is important to consider for all patients with neuroendocrine tumor is the primary site of disease. Um, we have seen differences both in the genetics as well as the behavior um, uh, between neuroendocrine tumors that start in the pancreas versus neuroendocrine tumors starting elsewhere in the body. And these figures are shown to, to demonstrate that pancreas neuroendocrine tumors, which are highlighted in this left-sided curve in, in the red, have a prognosis that's very different than uh, small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. This is data taken from a single institution database, in this case, Dana-Farber. Uh, the data shown on the right is data from uh, cancer registry, specifically SEER. Although the magnitude and the survival uh, outcomes differ, whether you're looking at a single institution database or cancer registry data, um, the point is that uh, pancreas neuroendocrine tumors do have a different biology, a different prognosis compared with neuroendocrine tumors that arise in other sites like the small intestine. 
So not only does survival vary by primary tumor site, but we also find that pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are more responsive to treatment, whether it includes cytotoxic chemotherapy or other uh, molecularly targeted agents. And for this reason, we now have distinct treatment approaches and clinical trials for patients with pancreatic and non-pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. The third feature that I wanted to, to highlight and discuss is the functional status of neuroendocrine tumors. And by functional status, what we're referring to is whether or not a patient has or doesn't have any symptoms related to hormone hypersecretion. Most pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, estimated about 60 to 70% are non-functioning. In contrast, about 30 to 40% are associated with uh, symptoms related to hormone hypersecretion. The symptoms that each patient experiences are defined by the particular hormone that the tumor is making. In this table below, um, I have listed several of the more commonly secreted hormones from pancreas neuroendocrine tumors, including gastrin, glucagon, insulin, and VIP. Patients who have a gastrin-secreting tumor experience symptoms that are related to acid um, excess that's triggered by the gastrin secretion, and these symptoms may include uh, production of gastric ulcers and also diarrhea. Patients with glucagon-secreting tumors develop a characteristic skin rash that's called necrolytic migratory erythema. They also may have hyperglycemia related to the excess glucagon. In contrast, patients who have insulin-producing tumors experience symptoms related to hypoglycemia. And finally, uh, VIPomas, which are uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that secrete a hormone that's called VIP, they experience profound secretory diarrhea with electrolyte abnormalities, including hypokalemia. Uh, the remainder of my talk is going to focus on management principles for patients with uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And one of the basic management principles is uh, to pursue resection of uh, disease for patients with localized and even limited uh, metastatic disease, particularly involving the liver. For patients with advanced disease, uh, there, it's important to control symptoms that are related to hormone secretion if the tumor is a functional one and also to control growth of disease. I'd like to stress that a multidisciplinary approach to treatment is critical. As you'll see during the remainder of the talk, there are multiple options that are available uh, for management of patients with advanced pancreas neuroendocrine tumor, and they can include surgery, liver-directed therapies, or uh, systemic therapy. Because there is such a heterogeneous biology of disease in neuroendocrine tumors and heterogeneous presentation, it's important to involve uh, multiple, discipline in, no, multiple disciplines, including medical oncology, gastroenterology, surgery, interventional radiology, as we formulate a, a plan of treatment. Patients also have uh, nutritional issues and other symptom-related issues that can benefit from input from dietitians, palliative care uh, consultants, as well as psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers. As we focus on the surgical options for disease, the type of surgery that is pursued will depend on the size of the tumor and the primary site of the tumor. And options can include enucleation for small tumors, uh, distal pancreatectomy for patients who have uh, disease involving the tail of the pancreas, and a Whipple procedure for patients with uh, disease involving the head of the pancreas. For patients who have MEN1 syndrome, because of that genetic predisposition, multiple tumors are common, and a different uh, strategy for when to consider surgery is in place because some patients will develop small, indolent tumors, which may not change very much over time and which have a more benign course, so surgery may not be necessary if they're small. Prognosis is very good when complete resection uh, can be performed. Even for patients with limited metastatic disease, surgery to remove the metastatic disease can be considered 
based on results and data from surgical series that show improved long-term outcome for patients who undergo a surgical approach. The remainder of my talk is going to focus on uh, the medical management for neuroendocrine tumors. I'm going to begin first by reviewing the options uh, for patients with functional neuroendocrine tumors with the focus on controlling uh, symptoms that are related to hormone secretion. You know, we've known now for, for decades that a class of medicines called somatostatin analogs can help um, by reducing hormone secretion from functional neuroendocrine tumors that include carcinoid tumors as well as pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Examples of somatostatin analogs include octreotide and, and lanreotide, and these are analogs of a naturally occurring hormone called somatostatin that binds to somatostatin receptors, predominantly subtype 2, that are expressed on the majority of neuroendocrine tumors. Of the five different um, somatostatin receptor subtypes, subtype 2 is expressed on approximately 80% of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, with the exception of insulinomas, which express it in less than half of cases. By binding uh, to the somatostatin receptors, the somatostatin analogs um, cause a change in the cell, which leads to decreased hormone secretion and thus less symptoms that are related to hormone secretion. Now, the role of somatostatin analogs has been best established for patients with glucagonoma and VIPoma. In patients with glucagonoma, the reduction in glucagon levels can lead to an improvement in the characteristic rash um, that I had mentioned to you. Uh, in patients with VIPomas, um, use of somatostatin analogs can lead to a very prompt reduction in the VIP levels and improvement in diarrhea. You know, although gastronomas and insulinomas represent um, the two most common types of functional neuroendocrine tumors, the role of somatostatin analogs has been less well established for these two uh, types of t tumors. In patients with gastronomas, high-dose proton pump inhibitors can effectively control the high gastrin level mediated gastric acid production, and, and the high-dose PPI therapy remains a mainstay of treatment um, in patients with this disease. Somatostatin analogs may also help with reduction in gastrin level, but it's still very important to use PPI therapy to um, further block acid production. In patients with insulinoma, as I mentioned, only about half of them um, have uh, tumors that, it, uh, that express um, somatostatin receptors. Um, so in patients who actually don't have overexpression of somatostatin receptors, use of somatostatin analogs may actually in some cases paradoxically worsen hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia by um, offsetting the balance between insulin and glucagon production. So if we're using uh, somatostatin analogs in patients with insulin, we really have to be cautious and monitor glucose levels closely. Other things that can help with the hypoglycemia in patients with insulinoma include dietary modification with higher carbohydrate intake, use of a medicine called diazoxide, which blocks insulin secretion, um, and then also everolimus, which is an mTOR inhibitor that I'll talk about um, in more detail in just a bit. I'm going to switch now to talking rather than about options to control hormone secretion from functional in neuroendocrine tumors to options to controlling the actual growth of disease. And this is the same slide that you had seen earlier, which um, if you look at the bottom half, focuses on uh, the treatment options for patients with non-functional neuroendocrine tumors. And the goal of therapy in patients with advanced uh, non-functional neuroendocrine tumors is to slow disease progression and also to improve survival. There are multiple uh, systemic options to consider, including somatostatin analogs, everolimus, sunitinib, chemotherapy. I think it's also important to recognize that in some patients with advanced disease that can't be removed by surgery, the disease may be very indolent. And for these patients, um, even though there is disease, if it's indolent, treatment may not necessarily need to start right away. 
and there may be some patients who are appropriate for observation, and these include patients who have low volume disease and no symptoms related to disease. The other treatment strategy, in addition to the systemic approaches that I've outlined and will explain in more detail, is to consider regional therapy, particularly in patients with liver predominant disease. Um, as I mentioned to you, hepatic resection uh, can be considered for patients who have limited hepatic metastases. Um, in other patients who are not candidates for surgery because of the extent of disease, another approach involving interventional radiology with hepatic artery embolization can be considered as a way to directly target tumor in the liver. But I'd like to spend most of the time now talking about the systemic options for control of disease. And I'm going to start first again with somatostatin analogs. As I mentioned to you, somatostatin analogs have been a mainstay in managing symptoms of carcinoid syndrome and other um, symptoms of hormone excess in patients with functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. But what we have seen is that in addition to reducing hormone secretion, um, somatostatin analogs, uh, including octreotide and lanreotide, can slow the growth of neuroendocrine tumors. So we now routinely use somatostatin analogs to control growth, not just to help with um, a carcinoid syndrome or a, a functional neuroendocrine tumor. And these are the results of the, of the trials that I had mentioned to you that have shown uh, the ability of somatostatin analogs to slow disease progression. The first study, which is on the left side of the screen, was the PROMID study. In this study, patients with mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, and these are you know, small intestinal neuroendocrine tumors, were randomized to receive octreotide or placebo. And this involved 85 patients with low-grade disease. And as you can see, patients receiving octreotide had a longer time to progression compared to patients receiving placebo. A second study, a more recent study, the Clarinet study, examined the efficacy of the somatostatin analog lanreotide. This study included a broader patient population that included uh, not just mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, but also patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, hindgut, in other words, rectal neuroendocrine tumors, and then patients who had a neuroendocrine tumor of unknown primary. Um, this study includes patients with both grade one and grade two disease. Uh, patients were randomized to receive either lanreotide or placebo, and the primary endpoint of this study was progression-free survival. And as you can see, the results of this study demonstrated an improved progression-free survival with lanreotide compared with placebo. The median progression-free survival in the lanreotide group was not reached, which was in comparison to 18 months in the placebo group. Because somatostatin analogs are so well tolerated, they've become a first-line treatment option for many patients with uh, advanced neuroendocrine tumors. It's important to recognize that even though they are well tolerated, they can have uh, side effects, um, and they're listed on this slide. Um, the somatostatin analogs can alter the balance between uh, the counter-regulatory hormones, insulin and glucagon, and then lead to glucose regulation disorders, including hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia that need to periodically be monitored for. Um, octreotide um, and lanreotide can also suppress secretion of thyroid-stimulating hormone, which can result in hypothyroidism, so this also needs to be periodically monitored. Cardiovascular disorders, including bradycardia, have been seen, as has um, vitamin B12 deficiency. One other issue that patients who are on long-term treatment with a somatostatin analog may experience is gallbladder disease. Because the somatostatin analogs can alter the contractility of gallbladder and also decrease bile secretion, some patients may develop uh, cholelithiasis or, or gallbladder sludge. So I'll turn next to another option for patients with advanced pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and, and this is um, a chemotherapy. 
So streptozocin is a, a cytotoxic chemotherapy agent that is an alkylating agent. And this was actually the first FDA-approved agent for patients with advanced uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And for years, this was the only agent that was approved um, in this indication. Uh, the approval was based on older studies like the one that I'm showing in, in this slide showing the activity of a combination of streptozocin with doxorubicin. In this particular study, the combination of streptozocin and doxorubicin had a survival benefit compared to another streptozocin-based regimen. Response rates in this particular study were extremely high, over 70%. But this is likely uh, related to the non-modern uh, criteria for assessing response. More recent uh, response rates with streptozocin-based therapy have reported response rates on the range of 30 to 40 percent. It's important to note that even though uh, streptozocin-based therapy is active for patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, the more widespread use of it has been limited by its side effect profile. Um, as well as um, a more cumbersome schedule of um, intravenous chemotherapy treatment. Another alkylating um, chemotherapy agent that has become more uh, widely used, although not uh, currently FDA indicated for patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, is the oral alkylating agent temozolomide. And this has been shown to be active in patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors in both retrospective series as well as prospective clinical trials. The response rates, um, in other words, the objective shrinkage that has been seen with uh, temozolomide-based therapy ranges between you know, 30% to as high as 70% with the combination of temozolomide and capecitabine. That response rate was seen in a retrospective series of patients who were treated uh, at Moffitt. Based on that promising result, there's a currently ongoing uh, cooperative group trial, ECOG 2211, that is examining the activity of temozolomide-based therapy. In this study, patients with low and intermediate grade pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are, are being randomized to receive temozolomide or the combination of temozolomide and capecitabine in order for us to evaluate prospectively whether combination chemotherapy has a superior outcome compared to chemotherapy with temozolomide alone. The primary endpoint of the study is going to be progression-free survival, with secondary endpoints being the response rate, overall survival of patients, toxicity of treatment, as well as um, correlative studies looking at the association of MGMT status with treatment outcome. So I just want to spend a few minutes talking about uh, MGMT. You know, there's been much interest in oncology um, in general, as well as in uh, the treatment of patients with neuroendocrine tumors, and trying to identify whether or not we can predict based on tumor characteristics whether or not any particular uh, therapy is going to be active. As I mentioned to you, temozolomide works by alkylating or uh, damaging the tumor DNA. Any cell, including a tumor cell, can repair damage to DNA through an enzyme that's called MGMT. And by repairing the damage, uh, the tumor cell can survive. And that's in contrast to a tumor that has intact MGMT, where that repair cannot be um, corrected and uh, therefore leads to tumor cell death. And we can identify whether or not a tumor has MGMT or not through staining uh, of the tumor. And this uh, top panel shows a tumor that has MGMT that's intact, and the bottom panel shows a tumor that lacks this enzyme. In the study that was done uh, here at Dana-Farber, we found that patients that lacked the enzyme had a different outcome compared to tumors that had uh, the MGMT uh, enzyme intact. With uh, deficient MGMT, there was a response rate of 80%, four out of five patients, with longer progression-free survival compared to tumors that had that uh, enzyme intact. And other groups have seen similar findings that patients with um, uh, patients who uh, have tumors that are deficient in MGMT have improved outcomes to patients with uh, tumors that, that have MGMT intact. 
So it's important to recognize that the number of patients that, that were studied um, in these, uh, in these um, in retrospective uh, studies have, have been small, and the, um, the ongoing ECOG study will, in a larger way and in a prospective way, better evaluate the role of MGMT in predicting response to temozolomide-based therapy. I want to turn now, rather than to cytotoxic chemotherapy, to the role of targeted therapy for patients with neuroendocrine tumors. As many people know, targeted therapy is a way to treat cancer by blocking growth factors, uh, growth factor receptors, or the signals that are in the cell that become activated and stimulate cell growth. Activation of the mTOR pathway has been implicated in the proliferation of neuroendocrine tumor one way is through um, uh, activation by IGF-1. Another way of activation of the mTOR pathway is um, through downregulation of these tumor suppressor genes that I would mentioned earlier to you, um, TSC2, and another one called P10 that can lead to activation of mTOR um, in uh, patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. One way to block this pathway is through use of everolimus. Everlimus has been studied compared to placebo in a, a randomized phase three study. Um, and as you can see from these curves, patients with advanced uh, pancreatic tumors receiving everolimus have improved progression-free survival uh, compared to patients um, receiving placebo. And based on the results of this study, um, Everlimus became approved for the treatment of patients with advanced progressive pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors in 2011. Another pathway um, that is attractive for targeting a neuroendocrine tumor is uh, angiogenesis, which is the process of new blood vessel formation. We know that this process is critical for growth and spread of cancer, and it's particularly relevant for neuroendocrine tumors because neuroendocrine tumors are highly vascular tumors. We also have observed that there are high levels of the vascular endothelial growth factor as well as its receptor uh, in neuroendocrine tumors. And there are several ways to try to block this pathway as a way to treat cancer. And one way is through use of uh, small molecules that can target or inhibit uh, the VEGF receptor. And one of these agents is uh, sunitinib. Sunitinib has been studied in a, a randomized placebo-controlled trial um, that demonstrated improved progression-free survival for patients receiving sunitinib compared to those receiving placebo. So based on this study in 2011, sunitinib, just like Everlimus, became approved for treating patients with advanced uh, progressive pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. These agents have never uh, been compared head-to-head, -head, um, but the activity that we've seen for both of these agents uh, appears comparable. It's important to note that um, the objective response rates or the amount of shrinkage that we see on scans after treatment is low for both of these agents, but patients do have, patients who are treated have a high um, percent rate of stable disease. Where we do see some differences between these uh, two agents is, agents is in uh, the adverse events that are associated with each. Sunitinib, um, because it does affect angiogenesis, is uh, more likely to be associated with cardiovascular side effects like hypertension, also hand-foot syndrome. Everolimus, uh, through its mTOR inhibition, has been associated with uh, pneumonitis and hyperglycemia. So while we may not know that one treatment is necessarily superior to another, um, a patient's comorbidities may ultimately help decide which agent to choose first. There are also other ways to inhibit angiogenesis, um, and several agents have also been studied in patients with neuroendocrine tumor, and they include other um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that inhibit the vascular endothelial growth factor, including serafinib and pazopinib. There are ongoing studies looking at cabozantinib. Another way to target um, the VEGF pathway is through use of antibodies that can target the vascular endothelial growth factor, and these include um, antibodies like bevacizumab and a flibercept. 
Ramacirumab is another angiogenesis inhibitor that's an antibody against the VEGF receptor, and there are proposed studies for evaluating this agent in neuroendocrine tumors as well. In addition to blocking single pathway, there has also been interest in combining um, agents with the rationale that combining two agents may lead to um, additive effects or synergistic effects. Studies have been done looking at blocking both the VEGF pathway and also the mTOR pathway together. One particular study that was reported at this year's ASCO was the results of a randomized phase two study that was conducted um, in a cooperative group setting. This was CLGB80701. In this randomized phase two study, patients with advanced pancreatic cancers that were progressing were randomized to receive everolimus with octreotide or everolimus with bevacizumab and octreotide. The primary endpoint of this study was progression-free survival. And the results were, were very interesting. The results demonstrated that patients receiving the combination therapy had a higher response rate compared to single agent therapy with Ever Everlimus alone. Median progression-free survival was the primary endpoint, and the study did meet its um, predefined statistical endpoint end in showing improved progression-free survival of the combination therapy compared to Everlimus alone. It's important to notice, uh, though, that um, with the increased activity, there was also a higher incidence of grade three to four adverse events in the combination uh, therapy arm. Many of these um, adverse events included um, hypertension and hyperglycemia, which could be medically managed. It's important to recognize that we do need future studies to quantify the benefits of combination therapy, and importantly, in which patients and in which setting so this is particularly important as we recognize the balance of um, the importance of balancing efficacy with toxicity and quality of life for a disease that people can live a long time with. I'm going to close with a, a few words about peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. This is another form of therapy that takes advantage of the somatostatin receptors that are present on many neuroendocrine tumors. And peptide receptor radionuclide therapy consists of a radio-labeled somatostatin analog. There's a somatostatin analog that is conjugated with radionuclides that include indium-111, Y90, and uh, more recently studies uh, looking at lutetium-177. By administering this treatment, uh, tumorcidal doses of radiation can be delivered to somatostatin receptor-positive tumors. This type of therapy has been available in, in primarily Europe for many years, and studies have been done um, that have summarized their experience. And as you can see, the objective response rates in patients with gastrointestinal and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors treated with various forms of PRRT have been high and on the range of up to 30%. Some studies have also reported that patients who are symptomatic at baseline when treated with PRRT had a durable improvement in their symptoms. Some of the adverse events um, that can be associated with PRRT include GI symptoms, in which um, consist of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, some abdominal pain, fatigue, and anorexia. The more rare but serious adverse events um, that are monitored for include hematologic toxicity and rarely um, cases of MDS and AML, kidney failure, or renal failure. This past year, the results of a randomized phase three study um, examining PRRT with lutetium-177 dotatate versus high-dose octreotide in patients with progressive somatostatin receptor-positive mid-gut carcinoid tumors was reported. In this study, patients with um, disease that was growing on standard doses of octreotide were randomized to receive either PRRT with lutetium-177 uh, dotatate every eight weeks um, for four cycles along with octreotide or high-dose octreotide. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And as you can see from these Kaplan-Meier curves, the patients who received uh, PRRT had improved progression-free survival compared to those receiving octreotide LAR. 
the median progression-free survival for patients receiving lutetium 170 dodotate was not reached compared to um, 8.4 months in those receiving high-dose octreotide LAR. Um, an interim survival analysis of an interim analysis of overall survival also favored the PRRT arm. Long-term follow-up of these patients for both survival and adverse events is anticipated. We also hope that um, prospective studies evaluating PRRT um, in patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor can also um, um, shed some light on, on the activity of PRRT in patients with not just mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, but pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, for just a couple of minutes, I want to talk about high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas. Everything that I've mentioned so far has primarily um, uh, referred to options for patients with low and intermediate-grade disease. Patients with high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas are typically treated with platinum-based chemotherapy. We have, however, seen uh, from retrospective studies that the proliferation index that is seen in a biopsy may predict whether or not uh, a patient uh, may be sensitive to platinum-based chemotherapy. Higher proliferation indices of greater than 55% may predict sensitivity, whereas lower indices may uh, predict a lack of sensitivity. We also don't know uh, the role of targeted therapies in patients with high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas. Some patients with high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas may be uh, sensitive to temozolomide-based chemotherapy, which I um, have uh, mentioned to you as being active in patients with low and intermediate-grade disease. One study that um, has recently activated is an, an ECOG-ACRIN study, ECOG-ACRIN 2142, and this is a randomized phase two study of cisplatin and atopicide versus temozolomide and capecitabine for patients with high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas of the GI tract in the pancreas. So the results of this study will um, shed some light on the optimal chemotherapy uh, options for patients with high-grade disease. So I'll close. Um, I think I skipped a few slides, but I was going to close with a, um, a set of slides that um, just reviewed in general the landscape for patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and some of the unanswered questions, um, including what is the best first line of therapy, um, sequence of therapy, and, and roles of combination therapy. Okay, hey, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we now have time to answer some questions. So the first question that we've got uh, addressed to Dr. Chen is, uh, can a tumor just lay and do nothing forever? Mine has been dormant for at least three years, but being monitored. Yeah, we, we do see patients who have very indolent disease. Um, you know, when a patient is first diagnosed with disease, it's hard to predict what the course will be. We can sometimes, just based on a biopsy, seeing low-grade disease, predict that it will be an indolent course. But I do, in my own practice, have patients who I have been following for years who have disease that hasn't changed. It really does speak to the indolent nature of the disease. Okay. Uh, we have another one here um, that says, my husband has MEN1. Should we have our kids tested? I think if your husband has um, MEN1 and he's himself undergone genetic testing to confirm that, it is recommended that first-degree relatives also be tested as well. Okay. Uh, the next one I've got here is, if time permits, a discussion of best methods of follow-ups for patients who had a resection. What blood work and scans and how often and is gallium scan coming to the U.S.? So that's a very good question. Um, you know, there are not standardized guidelines about the follow-up, and I think um, I often will individualize it based on a patient's risk. Um, you know, how large was the tumor after surgery? Was it were there lymph nodes involved? Um, you know, I, I in general for patients who do have a risk of recurrence will get scans somewhere on the order of every six to twelve months. Uh, the role of markers in the surveillance of patients after surgery is somewhat controversial. Um, markers like chromogranin can be assessed. It's important to recognize that, you know, if you're doing these markers, um, ones like chromogranin, there are some um, 
uh, some medicines, for instance, proton pump inhibitors that do need to be stopped in order to interpret the results. You know, regarding gallium-68 scans, they should, we hope, be coming to the United States soon. We have, what is the KI-67 that was shown a couple of times? So KI-67, um, it was on one of the earlier slides. So KI-67 is a proliferation uh, marker. It's a stain that pathologists will now routinely apply to a biopsy or a, a resection specimen to highlight the cells that are proliferating. And there are grading criteria for characterizing a tumor as high-grade, low-grade, um, intermediate-grade based on what that actual stain uh, result is. So in general, zero to two percent is low grade, um, two or more to 20 is uh, intermediate grade, and greater than 20 is high grade. Are there certain therapies or treatments that will preclude a patient from having PRRT or vice versa? That's a good question. You know, PRRT um, is something that is relatively new to the United States, so there are a lot of unanswered questions about that. Um, one of the um, hepatic artery embolization techniques um, can involve yttrium-90, so there has been some question and concern raised about whether or not if somebody's had um, Y90 hepatic artery embolization, whether that's going to be a limiting factor for PRRT. Um, the real answer right now is that we don't know, but there have been some questions that have been asked about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, you did not mention sandos Thetan. Uh, where does this fit into the treatment options, and have alternatives to this drug been developed? So sandostatin is octreotide, and that's one of the somatostatin analogs that I had mentioned to you. I, I had um, referred to these agents by their their um, their medical names rather than trade names, but octreotide um, long-acting release is um, sandostatin long-acting release, which uh, many patients are on. The alternatives um, would be, you know, some of the other treatments that I had mentioned to you. So if the patient has been on a somatostatin analog like octreotide and their cancer is growing, we can consider um, other targeted agents or chemotherapy or, or clinical trials. Thank you. Now, is there a difference in the length of survival for non-functioning tumors as opposed to functioning tumors? That's a good question. For, for patients with functioning tumors, um, particularly insulinomas, they can be found at an earlier uh, stage. So stage, um, finding something at an earlier stage will affect outcome. Uh, for patients with advanced disease, uh, there hasn't been anything definite showing out, out, outcome differences between functional and non-functional. Here's one that says, uh, I had pancreatic NET with liver metastasis. I had two surgeries, one on the pancreas with no Whipple and one on the liver. I was tumor-free for more than 10 years and now have a return of very small NET in the pancreas. Is it uh, unusual to have return of NET after? So, you know, patients will recur um, after surgery. This, In this particular case, it seems um, like there was a, a long delay. So, again, it may speak to the indolent nature of disease. But after surgery, there can be recurrences, and particularly it's in patients where there may be more advanced disease, either local, regionally, or nodal disease at the time that the original tumor is removed from the pancreas. Now, here we have uh, one of our attendees. They would appreciate addressing any treatments for NET that have metastasized to the liver, not surgically removable. Um, Sean, am I able to advance the slides or go back to some of these slides? I lost the ability uh, to control a little bit ago. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you have uh, control right now. I and still have control now. If you have a little drop-down menu at the top, you could click the little arrow, and it should let you pick a slide number. Um, between those two arrows at the top. Yeah, so you know, I think to answer that question, um, this is a, a good overview slide that, that reviews the medical options. Um, so Sean, do you mind repeating the question? Yeah, absolutely. So the, our querent just uh, requested that we uh, address any treatments for NET that have metastasized to the liver and not surgically removable. 
Right. So this goes through all of the options, which was um, the majority of, of the discussion or the talk. Um, you know, they, they include, you know, medical therapies uh, with somatostatin analogs, targeted therapies like everolimus and sunitinib, chemotherapy. Sometimes if it's in the liver and surgery is not done, we can think about embolization approaches. Then, as I mentioned to you and, and we talked about before, there are some patients with very low volume indolent disease where we'll observe and not, not start treatment right away until there is more significant progression, evidence of progression. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we've got one that says, so we don't think NET are actually increasing, but we are just recognizing and diagnosing it more accurately now? So the, there does appear to be an incidence. Some of it is from classification changes. Some of it also is, um, you know, the earlier diagnosis. It's a bit hard to tease out whether or not there is an actual true increase or not. But, what we, but there are definitely an increase in the number of diagnoses that are being made. Uh, and here we actually have the the last question that I've got on the list, and that is, I thought standard of care was used instead of placebo in pancreas cancer clinical trials. If placebo is it, if it's a placebo, is it particularly difficult to enroll patients in trials? You know, when when these studies were conducted, um, there were very limited treatment options available for patients, which is why there were placebo-controlled studies. Now, as there are treatments that are available, I think we would um, you know, want to make sure that patients do have access or have had prior treatment. So the, the design of trials in the future may be different um, now that there are active and approved agents. You know, what I would say is that it is important when we design clinical trials in some instances to have the placebo, especially when there aren't alternatives. It helps us to def definitely understand the true value of, of these therapies. You know, as you can see, these were all very large studies that um, have included placebo. There are still are even some neuroendocrine studies that are now being designed with placebo, recognizing that uh, although we do have active agents, there are situations that we come across where Maybe somebody has already had all the standard agents, and, and in that case, um, there will be a, a placebo arm. And we have time for one more question, and one question has come through, and that is, when should a patient consider switching to lanreotide from octreotide? You know, switching therapy hasn't been um, looked at um, in, in much detail, and I think that you know, we don't we don't have data yet to suggest that if somebody has needed a change from octreotide for growth, whether a switch to a, a different somatostatin analog is going to confirm benefit. So I'd say that you know the answer to that question is really unknown. All right. Well, they're very you. yeah, they're very similar treatments. Mm. Okay, well, again, thank you very much for uh, your presentation today. Uh, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network would also like to extend their thank you to Dr. Chan for her presentation. The PowerPoint slides in the recording of this webinar will be available at pancan.org under the Educational Events page. There may be a delay of several days before the information is posted, so your patience is appreciated. Once again, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network would like to thank their webinar sponsor, Lilly Oncology. The survey will pop up once you leave today's session, so please take a moment to share your feedback. And again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chan. Thank you for having me. That will conclude the webinar. You may now disconnect. <laughs>